Welcome to track three of day two of the Diana Initiative. Our next talk is going to be about leveling up in the cyber world. But before we get to the pre-recorded version of this talk, and then there'll be Q&A with the uh, actual presenters, uh, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, MongoDB, Microsoft, Amazon, Intel, Remediant, Thermo, Fisher, Coinbase, Scarphone, Cybersecurity, Kazo, and many, many others. Without our sponsors, we would not be able to accomplish any of this. And to remind you that today, our final, final keynote will begin a little bit later than is on the schedule, about 30 minutes later, so that everyone can wrap up the villages, which you should be visiting. The Career Village, the Maker's Village, the Red Team Village, and even the networking area where it just pairs you up with someone random which is a pretty fun little place to uh, to do that. So without any further ado, we are going to begin watching Leveling Up in the Cyber World featuring Minakshi SL and Sandra Bino. Roll the tape. So... Gender gap in cybersecurity, no women in cybersecurity. We all have read articles about it and there are a lot of reasons why. But hey, we are women in security and we are here for a reason. Today we'll be introducing you to the world of cybersecurity in the most beautiful way, that is through CTFs. By the end of the talk, you'll know what a CTF is. You'll be introduced to the two fields, uh, reverse engineering and cryptography. Finally, we'll also give you some good resources to learn and also some good tips to help you stand on your own feet in the world of cybersecurity. Hi guys, uh, I'm not sure how how I should greet you all because it's morning for some of us and it's evening for a few others. So I'm just going to say good morning uh, to all of you and to talk about us. We are students from India and we're currently doing our first semester in computer science engineering. Uh, and I'm sure by now you guys are wondering what these kids are doing around here. So we are the members of uh, a cybersecurity club back in our college. Uh, the cybersecurity club is called Team BIOS. We are also members of a CTF team called Team Shakti. And both the teams are CTF teams. And since you guys are already here, let me guess, you heard about CTFs already. Uh, so both our CTF teams, uh, Team BIOS and Team Shakti, are ranked among the, among the top 20 teams in the country and team bios is actually ranked first uh, in the, in our country so basically what i'm saying is uh, we play ctfs for almost all through for almost most of part of the year and more than even attending college classes we actually play ctfs we organize ctfs like in ctf j in ctf national in ctf international to encourage students uh, from schools as well as colleges to uh, develop their skills in cyber security and basically computer science. Uh, moving on to the agenda for the day, I'm not sure, uh, I'm sure most of you here have heard about CTFs at least. So we'll be introducing you to the various categories mainly found in CTFs and we'll be diving into two of those that is reverse engineering and cryptography like Meenakshi said earlier. And later we'll also be talking about how we formed the CTF team and how important it is to have a CTF community and how much it has helped us. Uh, not just technically, but also in improving our team team work and team leadership skills. So now, what is a CTF? What is it? Uh, so when we joined college for computer science, our ultimate aim was to be a software engineer by default. And knowing more about CTFs, uh, knowing more about the field, we actually got a clear picture that CTFs are just as important to cybersecurity as coding and problem solving is to become a software engineer. So first we talked about how important CTFs are and why it is important. So now I'm going to talk to you guys about the different types of CTFs that we have. Uh, now, firstly, Jeopardy CTFs basically have challenges from different categories, which can be solved locally on your machine. And we can just obtain the flags from, the, uh, from our local machines. And in attack and defense CTFs, uh, we have all, all the teams in an registered to an attack and defense CTF are connected to a server through a VM provided by the organizer, which has services running and flags are planted in all the VMs at the same time. Teams attack other teams and 
teams basically have to find the vulnerabilities in their own machine and and they have to attack the other machines and grab their flags to submit them so that's that's an amazing way of learning how to find vulnerabilities and again we have to patch our machines after finding the vulnerabilities and that is how and again there you know how to protect your systems from such vulnerabilities But hey, what's the point? You could just uh, do some certification courses and get some training. But what kind of stuff allows you to have fun while learning? What kind of stuff allows you to game, make friends, like collaborate with your team, and still, you know, learn about the latest vulnerabilities in software? Yes, that is what CTFs are all about. So the classical categories in CTFs. include uh, cryptography web exploitation reverse engineering forensics and bonding now some of the newer categories include osint hardware pen testing and some even include satellite hacking let's dive into the main stuff so sandra is going to uh, guide you through a reversing session and be handing over the mic to her. uh okay so hi again and like i said before i we will be dealing with the two main categories in ctf that is reversing and cryptography and i will be talking about reverse engineering so let's dive right into it today we'll be covering the following topics in reverse engineering before going ahead with the topic let me just give you a heads up that uh, it is definitely not something you can learn in a month or two let alone 45 minutes so our idea today is to give you all a head start on how to get uh, get started with playing ctfs and we'll talk about the central patterns in ctf challenges and uh, how to approach a challenge when you get a binary and uh, what do you do when you're stuck finally we'll also be solving a simple crack me and a little bit about automation so intro into re <coughs> So reverse engineering is a process of analyzing and understanding a system or a process and is not solely restricted to uh, software hardware can be reversed uh, too so basically anything you can think of like cars watches televisions anything can be reversed or let me just generalize it as anything that runs on code can be reversed and i find that extremely cool because uh, if it's code it can have bugs and these bugs are exploitable and that this makes everything exploitable and these days everything is uh, coded when i say reverse engineering these are the things that pop into my mind assembly library functions memory mapping control flow so once you've solved or gone through the assembly once and figured out the control flow of program it is as simple as reading words from alphabets it is it all fits in fits the fra- frame because nothing is more logical than a piece of code uh every instruction is makes absolute sense and there is no there is every instruction is there for a reason the easiest way to start learning reverse engineering is to go pop a shell write your own hello world program and compile it and debug on your own so uh disclaimer alert that we are uh, use the linux machine 90% of the time in linux based environment is what we work on so most of the commands that i'll be using here will be linux based commands so here uh, we are playing a ctf and we get a binary and what do we do so generally speaking we follow these three steps uh, in the in the following order to finally get to the flag that is uh, breaking down the elf uh, that is viewing the code somehow and then analyze the code and find a vulnerability and then finally exploit the vulnerability to get the flag just like you get the exploit and exploit the tool next we move on to the types of challenge files that we have in a ctf challenge so uh, any code or memory dump uh, can be reversed anything can be reversed that runs on code so uh, these are the general types of files we get for a ctf it can be practically anything but these are the ones we frequently encounter elfs and .so files are linux executables uh, and they are the most common ones 
the next one that we have as are ELL, exes and dlls uh, those are windows executables and sometimes we even get python bytecode that is a dot pyc files uh, and those are really fun to play with and uh, the rest are excel sheets uh, game boy roms uh, cpu snapshots and what not next uh, next we'll be talking about the tools and tricks that you need to solve a ctf challenge and uh, before we talk about the tools let's talk about the prerequisites and i would suggest every one of you to have uh, all of the prerequisites above when you attempt when you attempt an re challenge re as in reverse engineering so the minimum prerequisites would be uh, c and c++ and the working of pointers it is very important uh, for uh, starting with reverse engineering challenges uh, when you as analyze a code when you analyze assembly code you have to know how the memory dump memory works uh, assembly language preferably x86 or 32 and how the stack works basically the memory working with the basic command line tools uh, in or bash commands <coughs> and uh, there are two kinds of analysis approaches that is static and dynamic analysis in static analysis you you analyze the code without running the binary and in dynamic analysis you run the binary and analyze it at every step of the execution and the tools you will be using to do the previously mentioned static and dynamic analysis are the following in linux we will be using these tools object dump gdb or gdb peda which is an advanced version of gdb kidra r2 or cutter cutter is the ui version of uh, r2 that is red r and uh, the popular tools on windows are gidra ida x864 x64 dbg x32 dbg win dbg and irspy uh, and for the sta in static and uh, dynamic analysis we it is classified into three that is disassembly debugging and decompilation disassembling a code is or an executable is extracting the assembly code from the execute itself using the machine code which is untradeable to humans <coughs> excuse me debugging a binary is on a tool is running the binary on a tool which stops and interrupts the program after every single instruction and helps you analyze the state of the program after every single instruction is executed uh, decompilers are the most advanced among the tools here it basically provides you with the code of the program from the from the binary itself and for decompilation an amazing example is gidra which is a free and open source tool many others are paid so gidra is the best option for decompilation next is the approach that you have to follow when you are solving a ctf challenge uh, i would these are the this is the approach that i would suggest when you are starting with reversing so first you run the strings command to dump all the strings from a binary uh, next is the file command uh, uh, the strings command is dump, used to dump all the strings from a binary and similarly the file command is used to dump all the details of the file such as uh, what the file contains uh, and uh, what is the file type and the uh, 64 or 32 bit binary next you execute the binary to see what the program does uh, and next you disassemble and decompile using ida gidra redar and object dump for static analysis uh, and next i would suggest you to uh, analyze the path traversed by the input by static or dynamic analysis uh, or just figure out the control flow of the program functions and their arguments Uh, on statically analyzing, you have to find out the functions in the program and the arguments that each of these functions take. That will be very helpful when, uh, because when you see your input going through a function and coming out as something else, then it is important, right? So that has to be analyzed. Uh, later, dynamic analysis can be done using Radar, uh, Gidra, or GDB uh, to check through the check in detail through the program what happens after each and every instruction. Uh, and uh, in reverse engineering we are often stuck with the problem uh, because it took too long to analyze and it's hard to move on because there is a report or too much mathematics involved and that's when we play our next card automation so when all that sounds monotonous 
we'll play our next card that's automation ever heard about smt solvers okay so smt solvers uh, is are the tools that we use to solve multiple mathematical relational equations which are generated in the program and and uh, there these smt solvers completely change the face of reverse engineering so we'll be solving a quick crack me uh, from pico ctf uh, let's dive into it first we run the file command on the executable and it shows us that is a 32 bit executable lsp elf executable and we run it to find out what it does next we run the strings command on the file and it chooses all the strings that are inside the file we grep it to less pipe it to less and here we have all the strings we find when we run the program manually Next, we run the binary through the tool Gidra that I mentioned earlier, and here you have in the symbol tray all the functions that are called and all the labels and classes that we have in the program. And we go to the main from functions. Here on the right side, you can see the decompilation of the code, and on the left side, you have the disassembly. So on the decompilation side, uh, you have basically the code that generates this binary so that is much more easier to analyze and when you click on the decompilation on every function it directs you to the corresponding disassembly on the left side here we have the do magic function which seems to be doing some operation on the function operation on the input so here we have the input taken and input length being assigned to a value and there is a while loop so in the while loop you can see an incrementation in the code highlighted right now and uh, you can see that there is a sor operation happening which is being checked with a greeting message so you have the input underscore s and we're renaming it as the input itself and uh, the index of the input is all with the same index of the secret buffer that we have in the code and double clicking on secret buffer actually dumps the secret buffer on the left side here we use ddb to actually dump the values from the executable we take the uh, of we take the buffer of the uh, values from gidra and use it to dump the values on gdb here we have the 25 values that we got from the address we found using gidra and next we use the greeting message and these both values are sorted together to get the final input that we have that we want <coughs> excuse me the next we ha i have already written a script here that does the following uh, that is take the uh, secret buffer and uh, takes the string the greeting message and it sorts both the strings to get the value so uh, here i am also writing another function which actually takes which does the same but in a simpler format it uh, appends to the list the uh, zord value of the string input string and the secret buffer and finally it joins it as a string and prints it out Okay, now let's run the code. So here we are done with our first crack me ever. I hope you guys understood as we went through each and every step. So moving on, what do you have? What do you do when you have a hundred equations or a thousand equations to solve? You know, it's 
practically impossible to do it uh, manually well for that we have our math buddies at three the smt solver which, which i mentioned earlier so talking about z3 we have uh, on the left side we have a checker written in c which takes a, a 14 character string as input and has 14 checks to check each of its characters so uh, and it has exactly one output so uh, on the left side uh, we have the z3 solver for the same checker uh, where each of the constraints in the checker are added as each of the each of the checks in the checker are added as constraints to the solver here solve here the solver is s is equal to solver where s is the solver object and uh, s dot add is the method used to uh, add the constraints to the solver and uh, on running this module it will give you a model the solver will have and a model object which is the result of the checker so like i said before uh, this talk will help you understand how to get through with the ctf challenges and that you have a that you have to have a little bit of prior knowledge while attempting these re challenges so these are some of the resources i recommend you guys to highly check out and learn these prerequisites so firstly i have the bios wiki to learn the stack and the smb language it also has a walk through of to all the challenges from all the categories not just reversing and cryptography but all the categories which will help you out to a great extent and uh, following the bios wiki we have links to the to youtube playlist that i have personally followed to learn python and c language uh, next we have the ctf challenge archives from pico ctf which is yet another great set of beginner level challenges it's actually a high school ctf and it's a great way to get ahead with ctf skills i have also added the defcon archive of challenges that is a archive dot triple o where you have all the previous defcon challenges as well as other sets of uh, ctf challenges to start learning with so hope you guys uh, check it out so that's enough reversing for the day now moving on to ciphers and codes by meenakshi So, what is cryptography? Today, we'll uh, discuss about what is cryptography. We'll uh, discuss about the different types of ciphers and RSA, AES, and some resources. So, moving on, what is cryptography? Now, suppose you uh, send a mail to your friend. You send it through a public channel, and anyone can basically eavesdrop. How do you know that only you both can read it and not an eavesdropper? That is where crypto comes into play. Now, um, before you move on, we have to be familiar with some basic terms, which is, um, okay, let, let's take an example and just learn. Suppose you send a note to your friend in class and you want to play a prank, let's say, and you write attack it down. Now, you don't want your entire prank to be a flop because uh, the teacher got the note. So what you do is shift each character by two letters and then write it down in the note and then send it to your friend. Now your friend would know what the original message is because she knows that your original, your lucky number is two and she just needs to shift the letter back by two. So if the teacher gets a note, it's just a random chunk of paper, random chunk of letters. Now this encryption scheme is called a CSA cipher and is an example of a classical cipher. It is aptly called so because Julius Caesar used to use this uh, encryption in his time. But here, um, so here, the message is called the plain text, and the random piece of junk is called the cipher text. Now, the sender, your friend is the receiver, and the teacher is basically the encoder or eavesdropper. The key is two, and the encryption algorithm used here is Caesar cipher. But hey, that's too simple and easy to break. Now, Mm, it's just um, you just have 26 letters and you just have to brute force 26 letters and be a map over in a matter of seconds. So that is why we need stronger crypto systems. So let's move on to the different classifications of crypto systems. So basically, crypto systems is divided into two symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography. In symmetric key, you have the same key for um, encryption and for decryption. 
while for asymmetric key you have a different key for encryption and different key for decryption. You also have a classical and modern cipher. In classical ciphers, you have transposition and substitution cipher. You also have stream and block cipher. In stream cipher, you encrypt character by character, but in block cipher, you encrypt block wise. So in, within a single block, even if you change one letter of the plain text, the entire cipher text changes. Today, we'll be discussing about ARIES, which is a symmetric block cipher, RSA, an asymmetric cipher, and we uh, we'll go through some examples of encryption and decryption with Python using the Python Pro module. So let's move on to AES. AES is a symmetric block cipher, which means the same key is used for encryption and decryption. It is done block by block, so your message has to be a perfect multiple of the block length. And so uh, there are different modes of implementation of AES. The basic box remains the same, but when more than two, uh, one block comes, the implementation will differ. First, let's look at ECD, which is the simple straightforward method. So as you can see, one block is entered into the encryption box, box the next uh, block block is entered into the encryption box and you get the ciphertext. So you can see that two adjacent blocks are independent of each other. So even if they're same, you get the same ciphertext. Now, let's see how that is different from the CBC mode of encryption. Now, as you can see in the arrows, the plain text is first zored with the previous ciphertext before being sent into the encryption box. So even if two adjacent plain texts are same, the ciphertext you get are different. Now, like this, there are a lot of modes for AES, but we think that instead of, um, yeah, we'll, uh, you can just check it out later. Now, we'll move on to the demo of encryption and decryption. So here we'll be using a PyCrypto module, which is a module which provides um, modules for basic encryption and decryption. So you define the message here. This is a secret as a message, and the key is A in the 16. What we have to note here is that it has to be a multiple of the block size. And for AES, it is 16. And the key size can be 16, 32, or 48, um, depending on yeah, what AES. Uh, Scheme you're using. So you uh, define an object AES equals AES.new. Now uh, to cipher, uh, to encrypt, you just basically need to do AES.encrypt up and, and you get the ciphertext. That is the ciphertext. Now let's go to decryption. Decryption is as simple as doing AES.decrypt of cipher and you get this as a secret. Now remember that it's a block cipher. This means even if you change one character of the plain text, the entire cipher text should change. So here you see this is a secret. I change from uh, change the letter C to B, and everything else is the same. Key is A into 16, A is etc. etc. So uh, if you see the previous slide, it's um, here it is X C D X F C X B X the B A T etc. But in the previous slide, um. Let's move on to the previous slide. Yeah, it is A6, F1, 8, EB, and so on. So you can see that both are completely different, even if you just change one character of the same text. Now, before we move on to details, I think it's better that you have to do hands on and you should do something on your own so that it just gets into your brain and just gets written there. So I want you to, it would be nice if you just try out this point after the CT, after the talk. That is, uh, see how it differs for, say. So RSA is reverse Shamir Alderman. So it's a, an example of an asymmetric cipher, which means you have one key for encryption and another key for decryption. Let's uh, dive into some math. So RSA is based on complexity of prime factorization. Basically, doing 7 into 11 equal to 77 is easier than doing 77 equal to 7 into 11. You can just try to find this calculator, right? Okay, so what if I say factor a very huge number such as 1, 0, 8, 5? Yeah, this big number. Now you see what the problem is. So for RSA, if you have a 1024 bit key size, 
a computer will take more than like two thousand years to just find back by itself, and that is the strength of RSA. Now let's uh, see how all of this fits in. There are really three steps to a perfect encryption. So first is um, generation of two strong primes, and then defining the public key. Now finding the inverse and producing the private key, and then finally encryption and decryption. So first, let's see generating the public key. Now you input the necessary modules, generate the primes, p equal to get prime uh, of the how many bits you need. Here it, it's 128, q and n equal to p into q, and e is equal to 65527. So the pair n comma e is called public key because it's public to all and you can just share it with anyone. Now let's uh, see how we create the private key. So you define a variable called phi, which is equal to p minus one into q minus one. And there's uh, d is equal to inverse of e with respect to phi. Now notice here that phi can be uh, generated only if you know the prime factorization of n. And since, if you remember, the problem is very hard. So this is private to you. And unless you share it, nobody knows the private key. So D is called our private key. Now let's look into how you enter it and decrypt stuff. So you have the message, you convert it into int, and yeah, there you go. And for encryption, you just raise it to the power of E mod N, and you get the encrypted message. Now to get the decrypted message, you just need to raise it to the power of D, and you get back the original message. So it's safe, right? Not always. Sometimes n can be factored very easily. And there are various reasons why. Now, one of them is that the primes sometimes are very close to each other. So just so let's take the root of n. And if you take the factor, since they are close, now this will be this the root will be kind of close to p and q, which is our factors, which is our factors. So you could just brute force to obtain those values of p and q, and since they are close, it won't just take a lot of time. Now, Fermat's attack is kind of a more optimized method to kind of implement it. So you take the root of n, and b is equal to a squared minus n. Why b is not a perfect square, you should increment a and then update b. Now b will be a perfect square only when you get the correct value of a. Okay, now finally return a minus root b. You could do it in a much more simpler method by just taking the root of n and then increment it, uh, increment it by one till a is equal to a factor of n. You can do it in both ways. So let's take a sample scenario. So this is the challenge called weak RSA from Pragyan CTS. They have given the value of n. And we have to find p and q from it. Now we calculate the root of uh, n and store it in a. And we calculate b equal to a square minus n. Now b is a negative number. So since b is less than 0, it can't be a perfect square. Now you just keep incrementing it. And at one point, when you increment a equal to a plus one, b equal to a square minus n. And at one point, you'll get b as a perfect square. See? Now we can find p from that. p will be equal to a minus the square root of b. And q will be n divided by b. So thus, we have found the factors of p and q without just directly brute forcing n. So you can have further resources for this. You have to learn the basics of modular multiplication and stuff. And there are a lot of attacks which may facilitate factoring the uh, factoring RSA only if you know n and so on. Now these are some of the resources which I found useful for my study. First is Krypton, which is an educational library written by one of our team members, and it consists of the most common ciphers used for CTFs and the corresponding attacks and some challenges for it. So crypto hack is a war-based game, a war game kind of thing. So 
but it's for cryptos and this. And obviously, you have to look at past CTFs and this. But again, good resources are not everything, isn't it? And we just got started. So, uh, when you say CTFs, getting stuck almost becomes a habit, but getting along with getting stuck, uh, you uh, learn to get back up and find find new solutions, right? And finding solutions by breaking down the problem, Googling effectively, and most important of them all, learning to ask. Okay, but uh, that brings us to the next topic, next big thing in cybersecurity, that is socializing. Wherever you go, uh, there are platforms for cybersecurity people to network because cybersecurity, uh, in cybersecurity, it is very essential to keep track of everything new and be ahead of the hacker. So socializing to a great extent helps us to be updated with the latest tech and vulnerabilities and CVs by just communication. And that's the easiest way to get through with all, all this knowledge out there. Uh, and the community is important because it provides numerous opportunities, just like this Diana Initiative event, where um, it's a great platform to share experience and express yourself. It is also great to connect with people who share similar experiences. Now that you have this great community and connections, uh, it is time you made a great CTF team with the people you know here. And uh, start learning. This is not just an opportunity to learn new tech, but also a mentor, also to mentor and share your knowledge and build your team skills. So let's go back to the topic. Why aren't women in security? Yeah, a lot of factors. But hey, there are a lot of external factors, and we are here to talk about what you can do to decrease the gender gap in the field. So our answer to this question is form a girl gap and increase the number of women who are interested in cybersecurity. So forming a girl gang is great because you see all these amazing women working there, and you get a strong sense of empowerment, and you get inspired to work. You also have more opportunities for growth. At least some of you might have faced some kind of discrimination at your workplace because you're a girl. But hey, you don't have that in a girl gang. And you have more people you can relate to. And yeah, there are uh, people to back it up. There are some amazing men out there. And both my mentors were really great. And they were really supportive of me. But you know, there's always this one person. Also, you have more people who can back you up. In short, it's just really fun. So, uh, as mentioned before, we are part of a team called Team Shakti, and it's India's all only girls team. It's a student team, and it's formed just uh, it's comprised all girls, and it was formed to motivate and encourage students to join cybersecurity and to help women explore the various opportunities provided. The team was formed on uh, Jan two thousand nineteen, and uh, so far. We have organized workshops, seminars, a bunch of our women have got scholarships, etc. So this year we'll be organizing a Shakti Con CTF and a conference, which is um, organized completely by women, and we hope to see you there. So coming to a conclusion, what finally matters is you have to be passionate about your subject. Whatever you are interested in, you have to know it and you have to want it. And if you really want it, you'll finally get it. So I hope you enjoyed our talk. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Meenakshi and Sandra, for that. That was the pre-recorded portion of the talk. And we're just going to try and get Meenakshi and Sandra on live with us now so we can take some questions. Uh, and so as soon as we can get them on, we will dive into the questions. Manakshi, hi. Hi. Is Sandra joining as well? Hello. Can you hear me? I heard you a moment ago. I just want to make sure you, you can hear me okay. Okay, awesome. Uh, and I think Sandra was trying to join as well, right? All right, while, while she's just getting on, if anyone has questions for our presenters, please do go into the stage chat 
and post your questions there. And I will be posing them to the team here in just a moment. While we're waiting, Minakshi, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how you got into CTFs and, and why that was something that caught your attention? So basically, when I got into college, I really had no idea about cybersecurity. But then we had one of these clubs called Team Bios, which is a CTF team. I think you heard about it. So I decided to join that. And that's how uh, I got interested in the cybersecurity. Then I met a lot of people uh, doing different kinds of interesting stuff. And I got introduced into CTFs. And it was a great experience. Awesome. Uh, and I think, you know, there's, there's lots of us that have dabbled occasionally in CTFs and, and far fewer that kind of spend their whole time focused on that. But I know from my point of view, one of the things that I, I just um, get stumped by a lot when I look at that stuff is, is the crypto challenges. And so um, what when you were looking at that, uh, obviously, you both focus to some extent on those. I know they're part of a lot of CTFs. But what attracted you to, to the crypto side of it? And what do you see as being like the, the challenges and, and uh, the, the ways in which um, you have been successful and unsuccessful with the crypto side of the challenges? Well, yeah, that's always a point where you get stuck with stuff. But then I think it's my teammates that, you know, inspired me to kind of uh, not get demotivated when I am stuck with the challenge. Also, when you play CTFs and you solve anything and get the flag, the sheer excitement of it, it's just amazing. And I guess that's the that's the most awesome way uh, that you could get introduced to cybersecurity and stay on it. Awesome. Um, you know, what you were showing us earlier with the debugger side of things, um, the the tools that you were showing there, I think, are all you know open source tools. We, we, we know you know, a bunch of those, but um, I I am not as close to this as I should be. I, I, I did not come here prepared with a bunch of questions for you. I'm hoping some folks will put questions in the in the chat for you. But I know as I was looking at it, I can't remember the name of it, but there was a tool, there was a debugger, some sort of IDA tool that I remember using a number of years ago that I didn't see in the list. I was surprised not seeing the list. Is Ghidra like the, the, the top runner right now? Is that really kind of what everyone's using nowadays? I think Sandra will be uh, more. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I know she was trying to join. I was just texting with her. But I don't think I don't think she's able to get on right now, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, wish she could. Um, but I know she's in the chat for anyone that's that's trying to chat with her there. And again, if anyone has questions for the team, please do throw them into the the chat window in the stage chat. Um, so, what else is on your mind, Minakshi? I mean, you you finished up with a, a, a few seconds of conversation about diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, we're, we're here at the Banana Initiative. We're, we're very pleased to have you presenting. Um, but was there anything you wanted to get off your chest that you uh, didn't really have a chance to do in the allotted time on the video? So um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present here. And we really had fun preparing the talk and stuff. So um, what we want to, like, the reason we, why we just chose 45 minutes is that we believe that we, you guys should really try out a challenge rather than us going to the walkthrough. Of course. And you, yeah. you guys should really try out the challenge and get the excitement of finally getting the flag to, you know, just be excited about it. So that's what we wanted to convey. And we really hope you guys will be more into CTFs after watching this talk. So I noticed uh, halfway through your video, you you had a browser window open that you could see all the tabs on there, and I saw Try Hack Me was one of the ones you had open. Um, what what is your commentary for people that are just getting into this around which different um, uh, sites to go and try and and do uh, whether it's hacking a box, whether it's a, an, an explicit CDF, whatever. What, what what are your comments around which ones are good for what? So for beginners, uh, you guys could just try out some uh, high school CTFs. That would be a very fun way to start. Uh, that uh, includes just basic level uh, challenges. And with time, you could just increase your level of difficulties. 
and just go on to uh, try out challenges from more difficult CTFs. And uh, for women, we are organizing a CTF called Team Shakti uh, CTF, and that will be around December mm -hmm. or January. We'll be announcing it soon. So I think that would be a good opportunity to start. Excellent. So has Team BIOS competed in anything outside of India yet? How, how, how much have you been doing uh, with the, the global CTF community? We are currently among the top 25 CTF uh, teams in the world. You could uh, check awesome. out CTF time, which is uh, which lists out the. That's the great. How, how many folks are there in your in your team? In Around 60. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So have you gone into the? So that's from all. Have you have you been doing all the, the DEFCON calls? Did, did you uh, did you try and get into the, the, the team this year? Were you in the team this year? For, for, for the, the team? Yeah, uh, our seniors were in the team list for the DEFCON finals. Uh, two of our four yeah. years. Finally, yes, that uh, said that Murli and Ashasta also. So they both were there for the DEFCON awesome. finals. So what do you think of the order of the overflow? What, what do you think about the order of the overflow? Do they do a good job? Look at the guys that run the CTF. The guys that run the CTF. I was asking about the guys that run the DEFCON CTF, if, you know, what, what your comments were on how they run that. Uh, one second, I think I'm happy. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. So I, I'm guessing everyone needs to go get some more coffee this morning on the on the chat. We haven't got a lot of questions in the, uh, in the stage chat here, but um, I, I want to you know, certainly, uh, again, extend our thanks to Minakshi and Sandra for their talk. Uh, and I think it was a, a great intro for folks. Um, and if you do have any questions, please do throw them in the stage chat. And we're going to be getting ready in a few minutes for our, our next uh, speaker. But in the meantime, um, I think, no, that was not Sandra trying again. That was, uh, I thought Sandra might be trying again for a second there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. We have we have a question here, so uh, no, it's, it's it's I'm going to read it out anyway um, because I think you'll you'll uh, appreciate hearing this. So we have one of our audience is saying, "I love your level of excitement, and I learned a lot from this talk. I'm going to go work on my first CTF and try to feel the joy that you described. Thank you very very much for this talk." So I, I think that captures what a lot of us are thinking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and we feel really awesome. All right. And yeah, thank you for uh, watching our talk. Super. So, All right. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank well, you. thank you again, and I hope you get a chance to to watch some of the other speakers today, uh, and to experience some of the rest of, of their initiative. I know uh, if you haven't already played with it, we've got the the networking feature as well, where you can get connected and chat to uh, random folks who are also look into network uh, and, and there's all kinds of other bits and pieces on the website. Um, thank you again. Uh, sorry that Sandra could not get on with us, but I know she's in the chat and I'm sure you and Sandra are both going to hang out there for a little bit. So, so appreciate it and uh, have a very good rest of your day. All right, awesome. We're, we're going to get ready for the next talk now and, and I'll reset the stage. Thanks.